Everyone knows we need a medium of exchange. And since the old days of barter, people have been asking, what can I get for this? And it's made sense over the years to standardize that medium of exchange. So then, what is the problem with fiat currency? Part two. American freedom echoed into the French Revolution in the decade following 1789 and soon rippled into the Haitian Revolution that lasted between 1791 and 1804, which was the only successful slave revolt which established independence and emancipation after a bitter struggle with Napoleonic France. Despite the fact that the U.S. refused to officially recognize Haiti due to pro-slavery sympathizers, it was, according to author Glenn Lee Green, Napoleon's defeat in Santo Domingo that had dashed his hopes for a colonial empire in the West, and thus his hopes of exploiting Louisiana and the Mississippi River Valley. So with the fundraising necessary to support Napoleon's expected wars with Britain, the Louisiana Purchase was arranged, making the United States' domination of the continent inevitable. Haiti's success inspired revolution throughout Central and South America during the first quarter of the 19th century, including efforts to eradicate slavery and to unite the larger region into a Pan-American nation. These periods of intense economic instability afforded the Bank of England an elevated status, and everything from naval warships, guns, and armies cost fortunes and fade fortunes. The machinery of the Industrial Revolution spiraled into significance in the aftermath. Meanwhile, expansion westward expanded the influence and wealth of Americans, and notably of Southern plantation culture, who challenged anti-slavery efforts throughout the Americas. There's a good old-fashioned word for people us. We call them suckers. And there are other people. People who stay up nights figuring out how to take away what they've got. As you see, the top hat is still worn, but today only by a few. We are at a historic turning point. Money as debt is a form of slavery. It's just, it's changed everything. Congress, in essence, has ceded total control of the value of our money to a secretive uh, central bank. I don't hang around trying to read the entrails of what some statement in the administration may say, because it's our responsibility to make up our mind about these things. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. Picture a party of the nation's greatest bankers stealing out of New York on a private railroad car under cover of darkness stealthily hiding hundreds of miles south. The key difference in, with the CBDC is that the central bank will have absolute control and also we will have the technology to enforce that. It was a secret meeting at the time. They told nobody about it. The details came out later. But this is the place where the most important people in the world first came up with the formal plan to create the Federal Reserve. This place is crazy. I have alleged that there is a money trust. Better for the state relative to cash. Hi, welcome to Jekyll Island. To begin, first make a selection at the top. Right. 1803 marked President Thomas Jefferson's purchase of Napoleon's Louisiana territory, as well as the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars in Europe. I bet you were going to find a way to say the word Napoleonic at least once, if not twice more. Hmm. Of course, the real intermediary of this greatest deal in history and the cheapest per acre land deal that is almost possible was actuated by the Barings Bank, then one of the foremost lending houses in London, run by the English-German banking dynasty that had also facilitated the purchase of one million acres for Maine's territory and played a role in the Revolutionary War. Technically, the United States under President Jefferson paid into bonds that the Barings then sold to Napoleon, 
In spite of the crucial fact that Napoleon was financing his French war against Britain through the sale of Louisiana. 1804 marked the beginning of the Lewis and Clark expedition, completed in 1806, to develop American interests westward. At this time, while at war with Napoleon's French and Spanish armies, Britain began intercepting American ships at French ports and impressing Americans into the British Navy. Anyways, this geared up in 1807, Britain and the United States both banned the slave trade, nominally, that they were knee-deep in, with most European powers following suit and extending the ban to their domains. However, in America, the internal slave trade continued for decades yet, and schemes had been worked out in advance to perpetuate it. That much is extremely clear. On October 10, 1809, half a year after Thomas Jefferson left office, the third president's former secretary and Western explorer, Meriwether Lewis, was found dead under mysterious circumstances that even Smithsonian Magazine concedes may have been murder. It was presumed suicide, despite the fact that he was able to somehow shoot himself in both the head and the abdomen, respectively. Whatever happened, Lewis had been tasked by Jefferson with making his journal ready for publication, but never finished. Every object of interest, everything that went to make up this vast new land was noted carefully by Meriwether Lewis. Instead, the task fell to Nicholas Biddle. That's right, the very same Biddle who was the famed director of the Second Bank of the United States who battled Andrew Jackson. Biddle, secretary to U.S. diplomats in London and Paris, was also involved in the financial audit for the Louisiana Purchase and thus curiously tied to the Lewis and Clark expedition. Biddle's two-volume edition of the journal was presented to the public in 1814 as the official account, but in reality was not only edited, but a paraphrase of the original reworked into a composition by Biddle based on the journals which he wrote his own notes in the margins of. It wasn't until 1904 that the American public was given a clue that any other versions existed. In 1810, Tecumseh wrote to future president and then governor of Ohio, William Henry Harrison, arguing in part that the land sold or given by treaty to settlers was illegitimate because there was no deed, and no one owned the land, thus no chief anywhere had the right to legitimately sell it. He wrote, quote, Sell a country. Why not sell the air, the clouds, and the great sea as well as the earth? Did not the great spirit make them all for the use of his children? You said that if we could prove that the land was sold by people who had no right to sell it, then you would restore it. I will prove that those who did sell did not own it. Did they have a deed, a title? No. You say those prove someone owns land. Those chiefs only spoke a claim, and so you pretended to believe their claim only because you wanted the land. It's specifically land that drives the most speculative investments during this period with all the financial instability and personal profit that comes with it. In 1811, the original charter for the first bank of the U.S. expired and was not renewed with Vice President George Clinton breaking the Senate's tie with a vote against renewal. A new phase for the contest of American soil began, culminating in the War of 1812. Hostilities reignited between Great Britain and the United States in an attempt to settle all family business in North America. The White House was burned. The British formed an alliance with an uprising of tribes led by Chief Tecumseh, with London supplying weapons and aid to oppose the U.S. They fought over Canada and the Great Lakes region and for New Orleans in control over the Mississippi River, which was thwarted by Andrew Jackson, who would become a war hero and future president. Meanwhile, the American military challenged the Spanish claim to Western Florida, and the Creek Wars divided and defeated tribes in the Deep South. The net effect was the expulsion of Native Americans from huge portions of the eastern half of the United States region, and the ceding of some 21 million acres of land, which now forms much of present-day Alabama and Mississippi. Canada remained British, Spain gave up Florida, and the United States became the de facto heirs to the North American continent. Here, the London-based Barings Bank yet again financed Britain's enemies during a time of war, as their loans to Americans put finance in a curiously contradictory but lucrative role that comes up time and again in conflicts of history. Barings, too, were funding both sides of the Napoleonic Wars. 
It was generally during this time that the financial house of Barings pivoted its lending almost exclusively to the Americas, and in 1817 gaining official appointment as London agents for the Bank of the United States. During this time, Barings became unofficially known as Europe's sixth great power, after England, France, Prussia, Austria, and Russia. Though this distinction soon waned, as its financial preeminence was edged out by its close rival, the House of Rothschild, who were in ascendancy. Barings remained one of the majors, though, acting as paying agents through the 19th century for several countries in addition to the United States, including Canada, Russia, and Argentina. 1815 brought an end to the Napoleonic Wars in Europe, with Napoleon's infamous defeat at Waterloo in Britain's Wellington and the rise of the Rothschild dynasty to full dominance over banking in the Western world. Nathan Rothschild infamously bought up a majority of shares in the Bank of England at rock-bottom prices after false news went around that Napoleon had defeated British forces, while in reality it was the reverse that was true. A victorious bumper crop for the bank and its shareholders after all. The irony is quite delicious, sitting in front of the Bank of England here in the secret city of London, the quasi-sovereign city within a city of Greater London, is a statue of Lord Wellington, a prescient symbol of the dominance of the House of Rothschild. He was, of course, the general who won the Battle of Waterloo, but that's not what was reported the day the battle was over. What was reported here in the city of London was that Napoleon had actually won the Battle of Waterloo in 1815 and that Rothschild was selling his worthless British money. So everyone followed in suit and sold all their stocks and the House of Rothschild bought them up for pennies on the dollar and became the dominant family in this very financial city of London. More insurance business is handled in the city of London than in any other city in the world. Many, many years ago, and that dominance still remains today. Their building here in the city of London is just around the corner. The Rothschilds had supplied the gold to the Duke of Wellington, rescuing Wellington's armies from almost certain defeat. Between 1793 and 1815, Britain was almost continuously at war with France, placing a huge burden on the British exchequer. Wellington desperately needed gold and silver coins, which could be exchanged locally to pay and feed his troops and so sustain morale. In January 1814, he formally engaged Nathan Mayer Rothschild. Over the previous five years, Nathan had built an extensive network of couriers, dealers, brokers, and bankers to facilitate his trading activities in gold. In the process, he established a commanding position as a bullion broker in the city of London. Nathan instructed his brothers on the continent to buy gold wherever they could, secretly and in small quantities, so as not to disturb the market. Once amassed, the gold was shipped and conveyed to Wellington in southern France, enabling him to pay his troops. It may seem like we're talking about a lot of wars here, but all of these things and the land and the gold plays into all this. In 1816, some five years after the bank charter expired in 1811, the Second Bank of the United States was established by the federal government and again given a 20-year charter to expire in 1836. Nominally, the bank was established to restore the United States economy that had been devastated by the War of 1812. The irony and deep twisted sins of ill-fated history lingered in the air with a foul odor. Second Bank of the United States. Second National Bank of America? Yeah. Order out of chaos. Out of corruption. And then it has this picture with all these heads on these snake things. Yeah, famous political cartoon about the second bank. It's kind of awesome, huh? Kind of. I was wondering if they would have anything about the actual bank in here. So, in essence, they've turned the Second National Bank of America into a museum for enlightenment. What is the driving belief of these peoples?
these multitudes. What do they believe? What do you believe? The torch of liberty soon spread from the new United States like wildfire throughout the Americas, perhaps much faster than its shepherds desired or anticipated. Or perhaps it was an image meant to inspire, yet be dilute in their drink, because somehow in these same free ideals seem to deliver portions less free than those apportioned to a class of property owners and franchised with certain liberties to the north, distributed now to the masses those of a general electorate, holding the idea with even less claim to that intangible freedom. Liberty was an embodiment, a personality impersonating certain attributes, not merely reflective of new constitutional systems and its promise of democracy, but tokenizing the spirit of its minted currencies, symbols of its revolution with each transaction. A promise of systems fulfilled, or a promise counterfeited, discounted, discredited. A second currency was thus evident, not merely of a sound currency, but of sound ideals, engraved on the coin, impressed upon its material form, belief, Confidence, trust, these ideas were evident, many taken from the Enlightenment, embodied in the system of exchange, visible reminders, re-exchanged each time it changed hands embedded deeply in minds and forms of currency. Transmitting again and again through the symbolism and iconography of the money. In Haiti, the first successful slave revolt in history that became the second successful independence movement in the Americas. And from there it spread vigorously to Colombia and Venezuela, Peru, Ecuador, parts of Brazil, Panama, all undergoing independence from 1810 onwards. Indeed, the germ of liberty caught on throughout these lands, as evidenced by its coins, repeated images of walking liberty or seated liberty, the liberty cap, aka the Phrygian cap, again symbolizing capital, not invested in a single head monarch, but in the people in per capita liberty, a blazing sun and the all too well known pyramid with an all-seeing eye. These and other symbols of revolution reoccurring in the currencies of Argentina, Chile, Paraguay, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Bolivia, and even Puerto Rico, whose attempt at independence from Spain failed, but which identified with Bolivar's larger independence efforts. The Dominican Republic, notably less inspired by the exact symbols, but also pursuing independence, and for a brief time in 1821, both inspired by and in direct conflict with Haiti, which got the ball rolling and with whom it shares its island, as well as Cuba, 
which used the Phrygian cap, the blazing sun, etc., etc., which asserted independence in 1868. The coin of the realm was circulating the ideals of liberty, even if liberty proved to be a vanishing spirit. What might be the ultimate purpose of this system of symbols? Why did they become so widespread on the faces of these currencies? Second National Bank of America? Yeah. So, in essence, they've turned the Second National Bank of America into a museum for enlightenment. Part three, Jackson versus the bank. Story, Andrew Jackson, president who fought against the second bank. The second bank of the United States mission to stabilize the currency fell short as wild land speculation in the Western states like Tennessee were enabled by easy lending practices. It all turned quickly on its head when the second bank tightened credit in 1818 creating a debilitating cascade of foreclosures and, yes, panic. Andrew Jackson was among those who lost significantly in the land investments. In 1819, with stabilization efforts, the bank was saved and the people were ruined. By the 1820s, the Americas were effectively decolonized, with Spain withdrawing almost completely in the wake of Latin independence movements. However, gunboat diplomacy carries a great deal of weight, and Britain, whose world-dominating navy was built up by the Bank of England, maintained a de facto status as the protector of the Americas, with windfall towards its trade. Bank payments in gold resumed in 1821. 1820 brought the Missouri Compromise, escalating bitter controversy as Missouri was admitted, but as a slave state. Although slavery was prohibited above the 3630 parallel, in 1823, future President John Quincy Adams, as Secretary of State, wrote the policy that became known as the Monroe Doctrine, under President James Monroe. It officially opposed European colonialism in the Americas, treating the Old World in Europe as a separate sphere of influence from the New World. Britain attempted to issue a joint statement with the U.S. on the Monroe Doctrine, but then their 1812 memories were explained as preventing a unified approach. Following runs on banks in 1825 and 26, the Bank of England averted a liquidity crisis as Nathan Mayer Rothschild supplied it with sufficient gold reserves. One report in December 1825 described some 10 treasure chests of gold amounting to 100,000 pounds brought to England from France. The Bank of England and the merchants in the city of London campaigned to regain public confidence in the wake of financial panic and speculation attempting to reassure that the system was sound and that gold reserves were at their highest levels, allaying apprehensions that cash payments could stop again. In March 1826, outcry arose in London after cases of bank customers being refused payment in gold and offered Bank of England notes only. At the exact same time, Nathan Rothschild was reported to have paid into the bullion office of the Bank of England not less than £2,100,000 during the previous fortnight, further backed up with bullion. On the crest of a continued wave of independence and liberation, Simone Bolivar attempted to unite the newly freed nations in Central, South, and the Caribbean Americas at the 1826 Congress of Panama, with cooperation and participation with the United States. However, support from the United States was lacking due to Southern opposition to political goals intent on banning slavery throughout the Western Hemisphere. In 1827, during a minor loan case in the Court of the Common Pleas in Newcastle on Tyne, England, involving famed banker Mr. Rothschild, the judge questioned whether any man without the express consent and authority of the king could legally advance a loan to a foreign power. Throughout the mid-1800s, Manifest Destiny, the mythical idea that former colonists, now United States citizens, were meant to expand across and occupy the entire continent, grew out of the power dynamics established by the Monroe Doctrine and connected historical events, obviously. By 1830, after success in the UK 
and early experiments with rail delivery in the Northeast US, the first American steam engine train was built, which subsequently the following year, exploded. But the implications of the future were clear enough. President Jackson began his war against the second bank of the United States and its executive Nicholas Biddle, who'd been appointed by Monroe. Andrew Jackson, president who fought against the second bank, and Nicholas Biddle, a man who fought on behalf of the Second Bank and on behalf of the Rothschild banking interest. Opposing the fundamentally corrupt monopoly of the bank, Jackson called upon Congress to establish a substitute that would have no private stockholders or foreign investors, no power over land speculation. When special representatives were sent east by the pioneers to plead their cause and to protect their interests, they were refused audience and greed overcame all consideration for their rights but a bank with only the power to issue bills of exchange. Jackson succeeded in linking the elitist bankers, whom he claimed were using their power in making loans to influence politics, with a threat to democracy. To settle a default on a loan, in 1830 the Spanish monarchy handed the Rothschilds the rights to the Almaden mercury mines in southwest Spain. At the time, mercury was an essential component in the refining of gold. With the rights to these mines, the Rothschilds had a virtual global monopoly and therefore significant control over the gold refining process. These operations expanded greatly in 1852 when they acquired the lease of the Royal Mint Refinery in London, which they maintained for over a century, allowing them to control global gold output. It should be noted that in 1832, the elite Skull and Bone Secret Society was established at Yale and its founders were tied to the East India Company, sister institution and one-time rival to the Bank of England. Skull and Bones exemplified privileged, erudite men of the Anglo-American power base, with three of its members becoming President of the United States, three more becoming Chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and numerous others high-level executives on Wall Street and investment banking. In the 1832 election year, President Jackson's opponents made the bank a major issue and maneuvered Nicholas Biddle in January to apply for the bank's recharter four years in advance of its expiration, expecting Jackson to veto the bill in order to criticize Jackson for exceeding his authority by using veto power to block legislation. Instead, Jackson gained considerable support. Because done nobody liked them banks. Jackson vetoed the bill on July 10th, A week before, on the 4th of July, meeting with his running mate Van Buren, he famously declared, The bank, Mr. Van Buren, is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. (laughs) Bank director Biddle bankrolled the campaign to defeat Jackson, playing right into Jackson's claims that the bank interfered with the political process, thus gaining the confidence of the common man and winning in a landslide re-election. The nullification crisis tested states' rights, after South Carolina declared federal tariffs unconstitutional and thus null and void. President Jackson signed a bill authorizing use of force against South Carolina, who subsequently agreed to a compromise tariff, but afterwards nullified the force bill on principle. The Bank Charter Act established Bank of England notes as officially legal tender, printed at the discretion of privately owned shareholders. These actions now serve to define modern central banking, including the assumption of the role of lender of last resort and trustee of Britain's gold reserves. In the wake of Jackson's bank challenge, money lending functions were assumed by a wave of local and state banks across the United States, drastically increasing credit and speculation. The second bank of the United States, still under charter, responded by contracting credit, stockpiling reserves, and triggering financial panic and sharp interest rates. President Jackson redirected criticism about the financial state of affairs to Biddle, whom he chided had all the money, further inflaming anti-bank sentiments. The bank is very understated. They hid it in the back corner where no one could By April 4th, 1834, the House, led by Ways and Means Committee Chairman James K. Polk, declared the bank ought not to be rechartered instead urging the investigation of whether the bank had deliberately instigated the panic through shady monetary policies. (laughs) By New Year's Day 1835, President Jackson paid off the entire national debt, which is the only time in U.S. history that that has ever been and will ever be accomplished. 
the federal government raised funds through the duty revenues and the sale of public lands acquired through expansion. Less than a month later, on January 30, 1835, President Andrew Jackson survived the first assassination attempt ever on a sitting U.S. president, just outside the Capitol, when an unemployed Englishman named Richard Lawrence misfired a pistol aimed at Jackson, then pulled out a second pistol that also misfired. Andrew Jackson began beating the would-be assailant with his cane until both the president and would-be assassin were restrained by Senator Davy Crockett. In a bizarre turn of events, the attempted assassin claimed to be the deposed King Richard III from the Middle Ages and told his interrogators that money would be more plenty with Jackson dead, while claiming that he could not rise until the president had fallen. Needless to say, he pled insanity and was institutionalized. <laughs> In 1836, the charter for the Second Bank of the United States expired. Derivative speculation and other unstable schemes spread to state and local banks as real estate on newly controlled lands exploded. Figuratively speaking, of course. In 1836, Jackson's Specie Circular Executive Order responding to wild land speculation required that all government lands be paid for in gold or silver coin. However, as a result, banks had difficulty meeting the high demand for specie coin over banknotes. Jackson left office in April and the following month of May brought the Panic of 1837, a financial crisis that deepened into a depression that would last until the mid-1840s. The combination of Jackson's policies, speculative lending in America, declining cotton prices, wage drops, and the results of Britain's restrictive lending and lack of investment sealed the fate of a classic boom and bust, with prolonged economic pain. In response, New York banks suspended specie payments and discounted paper money redemption in specie coin. A recession lasted the majority of the next seven years, while banks collapsed, businesses failed, and jobs disappeared, leading to mass unemployment. The national debt, so recently paid off, now swelled. In the year after the anti-bank Jackson left office, under his successor Martin Van Buren, Britain exported a hoard of gold to the U.S., the article notes that the Bank of England, via Mr. King and directors of the board of the Bank of England, gave life and animation to the U.S., but will lead to extensive orders for our various manufacturers by sending a reported £1 million. The Rothschild Banking House sent an additional £250,000 and other firms various amounts, totaling about £2 million sterling. The newspapers touted the astonishing effect of the gold transfusion on the economy, enabling the U.S. to resume desired cash payments and meet bills from Canada. Ironically, it was on the package ship George Washington that 100,000 sovereigns were shipped with a larger payload on the Columbus. The first bank of the United suck. <laughs> Second Bank of, uh, of uh, Second Bank of BS. As with all history, there's the main story that takes center stage to consume the majority of the audience's attention. And then there's the behind the scenes story, taking place in the background, which goes largely undiscussed. Between 1836 and 1837, Jackson began transferring central bank deposits from the now set to expire Second Bank of the United States to selected state banks, which by that point were popping up by the hundreds. The U.S. was also negotiating a loan of 1.2 million sterling from the Bank of England to, quote, aid in America's transition away from the Second Bank of the United States, end quote draining further gold from two central banks thereafter reallocated to American states. Hard currencies flowed into state banks to pay for land purchases as dictated by the species circular, more than 57 million acres, while credit for public projects expanded uncontrollably. At work, however, was not just Jackson. 
financial houses based in the same country the young American nation fought two wars against were very much at the heart of this expansion, with Barings Bank chief among them. Canals and railroad projects, mortgages, all were readily financed by loans doled out from London's financial houses. And according to Reginald McGrain and foreign bondholders and American state debts, at least 42 major individual investors held titles of nobility in England. These investors had become accustomed to lending out an abundance of their idle funds and wantonly placed implicit faith in American securities. Quote, all stocks and bonds carrying the pledge of the faith of the state were given careful consideration. And thus, with the great accumulation of energy and currency, the stage for panic was set. But this particular panic was triggered in Britain, when in March 1837, three Anglo-American lending houses based in the city of London, Wilson & Co., Wigan & Co., and Wilds & Co., were suddenly unable to meet their immediate engagements. And after two rounds of intervention, the Bank of England refused to nurse these three W's any longer. And so these lending houses suspended payment by June, in turn compounding trouble with British finances and turning off the spigot overseas. As McGrain wrote, quote, The financial crisis in England destroyed the credit bridge over which American commerce flowed. Large amounts of protested bills were returned. American merchants appealed to the Atlantic seaboard banks for specie to remit to Europe. But much of their specie was already across the mountains as a result of the specie circular. After Jackson supposedly killed the bank, Nicholas Biddle immediately attempted to get it rechartered in Pennsylvania promising the state a $4.5 million bonus and millions more in concessions, which induced Pennsylvania to unwisely put all its eggs into Biddle's banker basket and allowed this iteration of the U.S. bank to take control of all Pennsylvania's financial functions. Its stocks, subscriptions to railroads and turnpikes, loans and payments, debts and obligations, etc. Pennsylvania even suspended its taxes on property relying on the bank to come up with that income instead. As the recession spread and national debt swelled, Biddle also attempted to set up a branch of the zombie U.S. bank over in Britain, endeavoring to establish a, quote, running credit of one million with the Bank of England in the hopes of circumventing bearings as the dominant house financing American trade. McGrain continued, the breakdown of the financial system in the U.S., gave Nicholas Biddle an opportunity to demonstrate his cleverness as a financier. The United States Bank and its associates came into possession of mercantile notes representing loans made on cotton. If the price of cotton could be raised, not only would the banks be strengthened, but American merchants would be able to liquidate their foreign debts through the usual method of cotton shipments. Biddle, therefore, decided to advance funds to cotton planters in order to enable them to hold their crops for a rise in price and to set up his own establishment in Liverpool to which the cotton would be consigned. But Biddle's U.S. bank couldn't keep up the payments on interest and fulfill its too-good-to-be-true promises to Pennsylvania. Instead, it failed epically, and the zombie bank had to eat its own, closing its doors in 1837 same year it was rechartered. Once leading the nation's prosperity, the entire state of Pennsylvania was now in default and on the verge of bankruptcy. Quote, its failure left the state of Pennsylvania practically without resources owing to the repeal of tax laws. This had a dramatic spiraling effect on a number of other states, which were also unable to make their loan payments. The hoard of $1 million in gold Britain sent to the U.S. in 1838 was not enough to stave off a near-total collapse, and the situation worsened when a crop failure in England necessitated a further 40 million pound drain from Bank of England vaults to purchase grain from neighboring countries. At this point, the American economy was pegged to the British economy, and banks in New York and Philadelphia who briefly resumed specie payments again stopped in response to Bank of England monetary policies. Under this period of questionable credit, 
McGrain claims that, quote, the best recommendation for an American loan was to have the endorsement of the United States Bank, end quote, which English bankers trusted nearly as much as the Bank of England, <laughs> possibly due solely to the official federal-sounding name. Although at that point, there should have been seemingly no logical reason at all why they should. As the U.S. Bank went ahead and assumed control of the cotton market anyway, a new wave of speculation started. Banks in the South, especially in Mississippi, began to make advances upon cotton. Futures, that is. And by the fall of 1839, Nicholas Biddle's reanimated, rechartered United States Bank, still somehow clinging to life, failed yet again, leading to a new wave of panic. Quote, This had precipitated the Panic of 1839, the full force of which fell upon the western and southern states. Every section of the country was now in the grip of the Depression, which had begun in 1837. In the wake of this, the real crisis, the crisis of faith, unfolded. The 1840s marked a sovereign debt crisis, wherein several U.S. states, sovereign and protected from creditor lawsuits by the 11th Amendment, found themselves unable to meet their financial obligations. Quote, The first shock to American credit came in February 1840, when Pennsylvania delayed in meeting her semi-annual dividends. To meet the crisis, Pennsylvania reluctantly passed new tax laws, but Pennsylvanians as a whole were completely adverse to all taxation. Basically, no one wanted to pay, and the state failed to collect sufficient revenue. That's when shit got real. As McGrain wrote, quote, Then it was that some in Pennsylvania began to advocate the repudiation of the state debt. On December 30th, 1841, resolutions were passed declaring in part that, quote, In the contracting of the so-called state debt, the faith of the Commonwealth has been unconstitutionally and illegally pledged, and the people are under no moral, legal, or political obligation to bear any burden of taxation. End quote. Although repudiation was rejected by the Pennsylvania legislature, this taboo concept that states could just shrug off their unwanted debts like an ugly dress they refused to be seen in public wearing was now out of the bag and would shake the financial order. Right or wrong, British bankers could not believe that American states actually had the power, not to mention the gumption, to just up and decide, nah brah, we ain't paying it. And thus, an idea that started at the economic core of the nation in Pennsylvania, consequently spread to Maryland, Illinois, Indiana, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Michigan, and Florida, then still a territory. Eight independent units in all. The U.S. had effectively reached a general bankruptcy. Foreign creditors were exasperated. By the beginning of 1841, the possibility of some of the states repudiating their debts was being debated in the columns of the American press. And not long after, Mississippi did repudiate its debts. Quote, in Mississippi, the people were moving back to Texas to evade their debts, and when repudiation came, the report of the state treasurer showed a balance in the treasury of 34 cents, along with receipts for claims upon broken banks and notes of insolvent railroad companies. 34 whole cents. Holy F-bomb. In antiquated banker terms, this failure to pay triggered a, quote, want of confidence in their good faith, end quote, which affected the credibility of all the American states, not just those in non-payment. In the spring of 1841, Rothschilds, Hope and & Company, and Joshua Bates of Baring Brothers addressed letters to President Tyler and Secretary of State Webster, calling their attention to the non-payment, end quote. Thereafter, the U.S. federal government found it impossible to borrow abroad. Never before or since has the good faith of the American people been under such a cloud of suspicion. And once more, just as in the days of Hamilton, it was proposed that the federal government should assume the debts of the states 
to reclaim America's honor. While Baring circulated a report observing, quote, a more comprehensive guarantee than that of individual states would be required, over in Gurney and Company of London notified the U.S. they could expect no assistance unless the federal government assumed the debts of the states. Baron Rothschild told an American diplomat to report back to the U.S. government that, quote, He'd seen the man who was the head of finances in Europe and was told, you cannot borrow a dollar, not a dollar. Wow, the rich man controlling all of Europe's finances threatened to not give America one stinking dollar. In the end, British banking houses disappointedly concluded that, quote, there was no chance for assumption. Inducing the federal government to come to the relief of the states was futile. It was unconstitutional, and moreover, for political reasons, the American federal government simply was not going to assume state debts. McGrain wrote, quote, Whatever expectation the bankers had that their plan might succeed was destroyed by prejudices over its supposedly foreign origin. Not only was the American populace too suspicious of foreign banker meddling, but many Americans simply didn't see these state debts as their own and so didn't care if they were paid. And this was ultimately the heart of the issue. Bankers in England expressed the greatest frustrations over the fact that Americans did not hold a collective view of their financial obligations. Quote, to English bondholders, this line of reasoning was totally foreign to their way of thinking. The lack of a national consciousness upon the part of the American public of such a disgrace was beyond comprehension, end quote. While the British bankers did not or would not distinguish between individual states and the Union, Americans refused to take on a national debt as part of their national identity. The spirit of refusal was also a reflection of the harsh economic times. In the midst of a depression, individuals' own private debts overrode other concerns. Quote, everywhere there was a sullen resentment against taxation and a determination upon the part of the masses to hold the banks responsible for their difficulties. Why should the poor be taxed to support the opulent classes in foreign lands? End quote. With the state still in default, a consortium of European financiers launched an all-out propaganda campaign against the Americans, circa 1843. They paid newspapermen, public speakers, and even high-ranking clergy members to chide Americans with moral lessons about paying up. As McGrain noted, quote, These agents were to write for newspapers, organize meetings of the domestic stockholders for the purpose of explaining the importance of keeping good faith with its creditors at home and abroad. The agents were also, quote, to endeavor to enlist the clergy to point out from the pulpit the moral wrong and danger to the people of not acting honorably, end quote. But as McGrain himself countered, these lectures on the subject of public faith were delivered by the organs of the bankers, many of whom had already forfeited the trust of the people. Yes, indeed, trust is a two-way street. Besides, the issue was more complicated than just a few broke states willing to pay. For many of the people, this was simply not their debt. While states had willingly, quote, pledged faith to take on loans, the people themselves had never consented. Moreover, the pressure to expand and build up American infrastructure was ultimately coming from outside interest. In hindsight, the ascent of the Industrial Revolution was part of greater aims than that of just a nation. It was always an international effort. While dodging debts is generally considered shady, it was British finance driving states to rapidly pursue so many public improvements. It was as if the U.S. from the get-go was a world's fair and expo showcasing a very specific future. And the scope of that was never honestly sold to the independent, freedom-loving Americans who had built their identity upon tax protest and a determined sense of independence from Britain, and yet by the mid-1830s found themselves so utterly entangled with its lenders. So repudiation, while drastic, was cheered on by more than a few who saw lenders as sinners, not moral saints. 
With a flip in the script, the financial crisis held a hidden benefit in some American minds. For once, repatriated wealth landed in American pockets and wasn't subject to legal recourse by greedy investors. As McGrain wrote, quote, To some Americans, this loss of credit in European markets was not considered a great misfortune. It was claimed the inability of Americans to borrow in England would free the country of dependence upon foreign capitalists. For years, England had been the banker or moneylender of the world. All countries had contributed to swell the overgrown wealth of England. Now this was all changed, and a significant social revolution was taking place. The return of American state stocks made it possible for Americans to acquire their securities at reduced prices. By means of the bankruptcy law of 1842, several millions of sterling indebtedness held in England had been canceled, by many of the states ceasing to pay either the principal or the interest on their securities, millions on millions of English wealth had been added to the real capital of the country." Astounding. Whether somehow intentional or happenstance, certainly it wouldn't be allowed to happen again. The propaganda campaign must have worked because Pennsylvania and Maryland resumed payments and other defaulting states made arrangements with creditors. Europe heralded this as an indication of America's good intentions and the nation's credit was strengthened and thus, On the, quote, eve of civil war, foreign capital was again flowing into the United States. Still, the American attitude of disregarding debts was a bitter pill for European lenders to swallow. Maybe, just maybe, a little conflict like the Civil War would teach them all a sense of collective punishment and duty. Okay, okay. That's speculation. But so was literally this entire period of history. Um, Oh, the Export Import Bank. The, um, the importation of gold to U.S. banks. It's a chapter of history that certainly doesn't get taught in school. During the same period that lenders were trying to rein in debt repudiation spreading across states, authorities were also scrambling to contain the anti-rent uprisings that took root across New York and other areas. So it was that when a sheriff set out in the fall of 1839 an attempt to collect back rents from farmer tenants in the hills of the Hudson River Valley, he was handed a letter. It read, The tenants have organized themselves into a body and resolved not to pay any more rent until they can be redressed of their grievances. The tenants now assume the right of doing to their landlord as he has long done to them, viz. as they please. You need not think this to be children's play. If you come out in your official capacity, I would not pledge for your safe return. Signed, a tenant. When a deputy returned with writs demanding rent, he was greeted by the resounding blow of ten horns. A call to arms as farmers appeared out of the woodwork en masse, seizing the writs and burning them. Come December, a sheriff returned, this time with a mounted posse, 500 strong, only to find themselves once again welcomed by the shrieking sound of so many ten horns this time being blown by more than 1,800 farmers, blocking their path with another 600 at the rear. All armed with pitchforks and clubs like something out of a Frankenstein movie. The rear guard did allow the sheriff and his posse safe passage back the way they came, as they promptly retreated. This protest was not simply against paying rent and taxes. It was against the re-establishment of feudalism, which had once again taken root, this time in the new land of America, supposedly of the free, 
at the hands of what author Henry Christman described as, quote, a few families intricately intermarried who controlled the destinies of 300,000 people and ruled in almost kingly splendor on near 2 million acres of land, end quote. The Rensselaer family owned the largest manor in the area and had amassed a fortune of over $41 million in 1830s money by ruling over 80,000 tenants with not just high rents, but the ability to take any timber they wanted on their tenants' land whenever they felt like it, and God only knows what else. The economic crisis of 1837, coupled with the layoffs that came after the end of the first wave of railroad building and the completion of the Erie Canal, filled the area with unemployed. The tenants who fell completely to the mercy of their landowner kings resolved, quote, we will take up the ball of the revolution where our fathers stopped it and roll it to the final consummation of freedom and independence of the masses, end quote. The farmers organized themselves into associations 10,000 strong to prevent evictions. Dressing in calico Indian costumes straight out of the Boston Tea Party decades earlier, with their ten horns recalling the Native American call to arms. Greeted with ten horns, surrounded by calico farmer raiders, sheriffs who tried to serve these writs were captured and tarred and feathered. The whole affair was extremely reminiscent of the era of Robin Hood. The ground between the Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest, the precursor to both the British and American Bill of Rights that not only forced the king to recognize the rights of the lords, but also those of the common people to use and access the land. Thus, as Howard Zinn points out in his book, A People's History of the United States, these American tenants once again had to throw off serfdom. Eventually, officers of the law were able to stamp out the violent elements of rebellion by showing them they could not solve issues by force, but instead by increased representation in government. But that didn't come without a fight either, eventually expanding the franchise to more and more everyday people, not just exclusively wealthy landowners. Hello, Miss Condit. Somebody's seen the landlord. What's up? Oh, the landlord. The tenants come out into the street to meet the landlord in a body. They know that individually they are intimidated. United, they are invincible. In 1845, the anti-renters were able to elect 14 members to their state legislature and proposed an end to the Hudson Valley feudal system. A constitutional convention that same year outlawed any new feudal leases, and the legislature voted to make it illegal to sell tenant property to settle unpaid rent accounts. A new governor elected the following year pardoned anti-rent prisoners, and the courts began to dismantle the worst parts of the feudal system. Leases began passing into the hands of the farmers, and yet somehow, the fundamentals of the unofficial American caste system remained implicitly intact. Zen notes, quote, it was a common sequence in American history, end quote.
Now spun the money, now what you done? Spun the money, ha ha. Spun the money, you gon' now what done? Now spun the money. Oh, spun the money, you gon' now what done? Spun the money. Great your potato. Ah, great your potato. Put a little piece of pumpkin in it, gon' make it yaller. Love, girl, love. Love, girl, love. Love, girl, love, girl. Spun your money. Ah! Spun your money, now I'm done. Spun. Oh, mama, go spun your money, go now I'm done. Aye, I know you like it. Oh! Money, go now I'm done. Spun your money. I went down to town the other day, spun your money. I see all them boys getting bouncy, not spongy money. What I call my bunny gets five dollars go on the trip, not spongy money. Oh mama gonna mama 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 gonna spongy money. Love girl, love, love girl, love, love girl, love girl, spongy. Oh, spongy money gonna now I'm done. Oh, you're going to Nara. You're going to Nara. Oh, you put one half a yard in it, gonna make it wider. Oh, sponge your money, gonna now it's done. Sponge the money. Oh, mama, 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 go sponge your money, go. La ni ni, la 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 Love, girl, love, love, girl, love, oh, love, girl, love, girl, spun your, I spun your money, go now I done, oh, spun your money, go now I done, oh, spun your money, go now I done, oh, grate your potato, grate your potato, put a little piece of pumpkin in it, gonna make it yellow. Oh, spun your money, go now I done. <laughs> hey, la, 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 I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, la, 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 la,